When we think about imagining a world where no one dies of cardiac arrest, we recognize that something new and something different has to happen. We know and understand that for this vision to become a reality, we have to think about how individual bystanders receive high quality CPR and access to AEDs and how our healthcare system uses new technologies and new ways to deliver training services to be able to make this vision and this goal a reality. But I'm here today to say to you that all of us at the American Heart Association, including our volunteer president, Dr. Ivor Benjamin, who is in the audience today, believe that we are not doing enough. And as a matter of fact, we know that in the hospital setting, for an example, where in the US 200,000 people a year suffer a cardiac arrest, only 24% of those victims survive. This is unacceptable. We must do something new. We must do something different to change this trajectory. It's life changing to either save someone's life or to not have been able to save someone's life. And what we want is in every single case for no one to have to die of cardiac arrest. A position paper by the American Heart Association was published in circulation last month and that established what makes out efficient education. And it highlights in particular three factors, being high performance CPR training with feedback, low dose high frequency refresher training at the worksite, and more focus on competence maintenance rather than the past and current predominant focus on compliance. Now let's assume that we could change the situation and uh, that we could achieve a higher score by implementing these three critical factors in most hospitals. And we could have an efficiency of 80% on all three factors. Then survival would raise to 50%. In lives, that make 50,000 lives more. 100,000 survivors instead of 50,000 survivors. And that is exactly what this event is about. This is my driver's license, and I'm here to tell you I am a great driver. I am a fantastic driver, and you can look at my license and you can see that. Now I'll tell you, my wife would disagree completely. If you were to look at your license or hand your license to your neighbor and, and try to convince him or her that you are also a good driver, what would that license really represent about your ability to be a good driver? That license tells you that you know how to drive. There's no statement on there about whether or not you are a good driver. If you were to pull out your BLS card or your ACLS card or your PALS card, I stipulate and, and challenge us to realize that's exactly all that that card stands for. It says, I know how to do CPR. I knew how to do CPR on the day at which I was issued that card, nothing more. Two-year retraining is not optimal. The 2015 AHA guidelines made this extremely clear. Two-year retraining is not optimal. Went on to say that for healthcare professionals who are expected to take care of a cardiac arrest patient, more frequent BLS and ACLS and PALS training is absolutely necessary. So I'm here to say it is no longer enough to simply know how to do good CPR, and it is not enough to think that you can do good high-quality CPR. We need to actually be able to demonstrate that you can actually do high quality CPR. So going forward, this is going to be the new, if you will, next higher standard of care that we are now rolling out and introducing here today. This BLS e-credential that actually stands for verified competence in CPR achieved by low dose high frequency quality improvement sessions once every 90 days where you're going to actually go and prove to yourself, prove to others, that you are truly competent in the basic skills of CPR. The paradigm of having healthcare providers in classrooms away from the patient, away from the patient floor where they do what they do best in caring for the people of our communities and delivering the highest quality of care must change. The time for us to change is now. This is the new standard of care. When we place the patient in the center 
of everything that we do. We must begin to focus on simulation-based mastery learning. We must begin to deliver on verified competence. We must be able to provide and ensure the healthcare providers have access to a platform that allows them to be engaged and active and provides them the feedback they require so each individual provider receives the tailored and customized feedback that's required to optimize their chance to save a life. One of the greatest hurdles that we knew we had to overcome and one of the greatest barriers that's limited our ability to truly provide our solutions throughout the full spectrum has been technology. We have created the ability to work with any LMS vendor to ensure that we can provide our content directly to your providers, directly to your organization. Overcoming what has been years of hurdles of access to care. The burden today on healthcare organizations is unbelievable. We face the challenge of trying to find the equity of cost and quality, creating a platform for value to ensure that we are delivering what is right for our patients, while simultaneously what is right for the system so we can continue to care for the patients. One of the most incredible insights that we believe that we have now seen is the RQI program delivers on that potential to generate savings. It is a complete change in the paradigm of how we look at cost and how we look at investments. We've had incredible story from organizations who when they move to a more efficient model have generated savings or who have been able to generate reduction in malpractice insurance rates because they recognize the new standard of care is quality improvement. We can and we will deliver on the full life-saving potential of saving an additional 50,000 lives each year by 2025 by creating this new standard of care.